So over the last couple weeks, uh, Lori, uh, Pastor Lori has been focusing on a series called Resilient. And this will be a series that goes through the fall, talking about what resilient faith looks like. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to be focusing on what resilient faith looks like in terms of grace. How grace impacts us, changes us, gives us a new vision for ourselves, the church, and the world. And we're going to be focusing on one passage and other passages that go along with it. But this one passage comes from 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 10. Paul wrote, By the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me. So in this passage we see three themes of how grace works in our life. We see, firstly, about a grace-shaped identity. Paul writes, by grace I am what I am. And then about grace-infused power, that this grace was not in vain, or it was not without effect in his life. And then we see about a grace-centered response, that he worked, more, he worked harder than any of them, but it was through the grace of God that he did so. And so we're going to focus on those three themes over the next three weeks, and we're beginning this week by focusing on a grace-shaped identity. In the passage I just read, Paul wrote, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And as we've studied Paul in previous sermons and throughout the years, if you think about it, you know that that statement was fairly radical for Paul. It was, a, it was a radical change for Paul. In previous years, he would have answered, he would have responded to that statement by blank, I am what I am, by saying, by my education, I am what I am. By my zeal for the law, I am what I am. By my status as one of the children of God, the sons of Abraham, I am what I am. By my uh, status as a Pharisee, I am what I am. That's how you would have answered this question. So it's very radical that as he encountered Jesus Christ, all of those other status symbols were gone. And all that was left is, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul has been uh, spoken of by many commentators as the theologian of grace because he speaks of grace and joy and rejoicing, which are all connected to grace, more than any other writer in the New Testament. And Martin Lord-Jones, a Bible commentator, writes about Paul's experience with grace in this way. He wrote, Grace captured Paul. Grace ravished his heart. Grace moved his entire being. Grace so gripped him and amazed him and moved him that it dictated the course of his life and was the source of his joy and calling. And I love that description. I mean, especially those active verbs that he uses. Captured, grace ravished him, grace gripped him, grace amazed him, grace dictated the course of his life. And as we read through the letters of Paul, we can see that those descriptions to be true of his experience. But I think it's important as we begin to study grace to think about, do those words describe our experience? Has grace captured us? Has grace gripped us? Has grace um, amazed us? Has grace dictated the course of our life? And there's definitely a right answer to that question. Yes, of course it is. (laughs) Of course Grace has done all these things in my life. But the actual answer in our life is probably a bit different. I mean, I know as I was answering this question in my life, even though I love to speak about grace and I love to even think about grace, still, I can't say that on a daily basis, grace captures me throughout the day. I can't say that I'm gripped by grace in all the decisions I make because I'm not. You know, we all have that statement in our life, by blank, I am what I am. And even though the right answer is to say, oh yeah, by grace I am what I am, still there are many other attributes that we put in that place. By my family I am what I am. By 
my education I am what I am, by my status I am, I am I am what I am, by my wealth I am what I am, by my job I am what I am. Whatever it is, I'm sure we all have different things we could put in that blank. By blank, I am what I am. And the encouragement and exhortation of Paul is that whether we put other things in that blank or not, if you are redeemed by God and Jesus Christ, it is by grace you are what you are. That is what is most true about you. That is what is most real about you. And that is the power that you have in this world. And so our challenge and our joy then is to continue to live into that reality. That by grace, I am what I am. For Paul, this is what, re- what separated Christianity from every other religion. Even his own um, background is living under the pursuit of the law. As he met Jesus Christ, he realized that the law cannot save him. It's not by the law he is who he is. It's by grace he is who he is. And it's the same for us. So today we're going to study about what it means that by grace I am what I am. And we're going to study uh, in Paul three hallmarks of what it means to have an identity that is centered and infused with grace. We firstly see that we are saved by grace. Secondly, that we are freed by grace. And thirdly, that we are enlivened by grace. In Ephesians uh, 2.8, you know, the famous, famous passage about grace. My favorite passage in the whole Bible, Paul wrote, By grace alone we are saved through faith, and it's not by your own doing, but the gift of God. Now that is a a passage I'm sure if you've been around um, the church for a long time, you've heard many, many, many times. And I'm sure that a lot of you have memorized that passage. I know I have memorized it. Um, and it's a pass- one of my life passages. But it's good to kind of break down this passage a little bit to fully understand what Paul is speaking about when he says it's by grace you have been saved. And especially it's important for us, I think, to know what the word saved means and what grace means. Because those are words that are very much overused in our Christian life. We talk about grace and being saved all the time. The word grace and saved was in a bunch of our songs this morning (laughs) that I picked very intentionally. Um, And we use that a lot. But so let's talk about what it means in this passage. Firstly, Paul says, it's by grace alone we are saved. And this word Paul uses very specifically here. This word means to be um, rescued from death. It is extreme action to rescue those who are perishing or are being destroyed. And so here Paul is speaking about something you and I can't do. He's speaking about an extreme action of God to rescue us. And if you look earlier in Ephesians, in the first part of chapter 2, Paul speaks about what what God needs to rescue us from. That we are dead to sin. And this is not a popular sentiment in our culture today as we know. Saying you are dead to sin to somebody would, could possibly offend them greatly. And just the idea of sin seems like an outdated idea to many people. This idea that there's this force in our lives that causes us to, to look inwardly, that bends ourselves inward, that causes us to rebel against God and causes us to hurt others, that just seems outdated. Usually when we look at the problems of the world, we could see, well, you know, it's really lack of education. That's the problem. People were just educated and educated in the right way. They would do the right things. Or we could say, well, it's an economic problem. If people just had enough, they would, they would be good to each other. It's because of competition for resources and lack of resources that people do the, you know, bad things that they do. Or we could say it's just a change of mindset. If people, you know, just kind of saw themselves more positively and saw each other more positively, then, you know, we wouldn't have so many problems in the world. But we can see that even though those answers are valuable in many ways, and they are definitely important, they are also, according to the scriptures, incomplete. We see that there's something deeper that the scriptures brings out, that that beneath economic problems and societal problems, social problems, religious problems, is this problem with sin. 
uh, Neil Plantinga, in his book, Not the Way It's Supposed to Be, talks about sin as a vandalism of shalom. Shalom is peace. It is the, the vision in the scriptures of how things are supposed to be. That the world was created in shalom, that where people are connected to each other, where the world is in harmony, there's no tears, there's no brokenness, no pain. Uh, the world is working the way it should work. But then sin comes and just breaks, it just vandalizes that shalom. It breaks it. And so we live in a world where things are not the way they should be. And this is not something outside of us, this is something inside of us. It starts not somewhere else, the devil didn't create sin. Sin starts with us. It is, not, it is me and you and it is us together. So no matter how, much, how many advances we have as a society, you know, now we, with our phones we can go anywhere in the world and find anything, but still we see that all of that advancement can't stop human suffering. It can't stop uh, humans' injustice towards other humans. It can't stop hatred and racism. It can't stop all the ways that we are hurtful towards each other. Because there's something deeper. There's a deeper problem. And the declaration here is that we've been saved by that. We've been saved from those enemies of sin, death, and the devil. And we could say, well, I don't feel saved. And the world definitely doesn't see, seem saved. But here we're talking about a spiritual reality that says Paul, that Paul says is working in us already. The word here is a perfect participle, which uh, indicates a past action that's completed. So, Paul is saying, you are saved. Even though we still experience these things, you are saved at the same time. In, the, in our experience, we are experiencing death and sin and evil. In ourselves and outside of us. But in the kingdom of God that is breaking into our world, there's another reality that you've been redeemed You've been given new life. You have been saved from those forces. They will not condemn you. They are not your identity anymore, though you live in the midst of them. So that's our first encouragement in grace, is that you are saved. That is who you are. You are one of the redeemed. And this is not something that happens when you die. This is not something you have to be good enough throughout your life to get. This is a reality that you exist in if you have faith in Jesus Christ. By grace through faith. And Paul says that it's by grace through, I mean, it is, you are saved by faith and then through grace. And grace is a word that we hear all the time, but it's important for us to dwell on it a little bit. The word grace in Greek comes from the Hebrew word hesed. And both words together speak about a one way love, a love that is focused on the giver and not the receiver. One of the best uh, descriptions of grace that I've heard is from Tim Keller, and he describes grace in this way. He says, grace is an undeserved gift given by an unobligated giver. An undeserved gift given by an unobligated giver. And this is a hard concept sometimes for us to understand because so often we don't experience undeserved gifts and so often, when we give gifts, we experience them as obligated gifts. We kind of feel like, oh, I, got it. I kind of have to. Someone gave me a gift. I got to give them a gift. But here we see grace is a fully undeserved gift given from a fully unobligated giver. And one example of this could be that, you know, for example, let's say you get a ticket. You're going on a, you know, downhill on a 25 mile per hour street and you're going 40 um, and... The police person stops you and, you know, the, they get out of the car, they give you a ticket. That is justice, whether we like it or not, right? I mean, we don't want to get a ticket, but according to the law of the land that we live in, it is illegal for us to go over 25 on, you know, any road that is categorized as that speed limit. So the police person is giving us justice when they give us that ticket. You, this is a just penalty for you to receive. But sometimes when we break the law in that way, the police person comes up to us and says, you know, you were, you were wrong. You know, justice would be to give you a ticket, but I'm going to just let you go this time. I'm going to give you a warning. And that would be mercy. Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. But grace is a melding of justice and mercy. 
that kind of produces something different. So in this analogy, the police person comes up to you and says, yep, here's your ticket, you broke the law, but you know what? I'm going to give you mercy. I'm going to take that ticket, give you something I deserve. And also on top of that, I've got a new car back at the station and here you go, take that. Enjoy it. It's, it's great. It's a very expensive car. And also, besides that, come over to my house this evening. My family having a big gathering. We'd love to, you know, welcome you in. And also, you know what? I've got an inheritance. I've been, I've been saving money for 20 years. And I just would love to give you that money. Here you go. $40,000 in your pocket. Have a good day. And obviously that, well, maybe it happened to you. I don't think so. <laughs> kind of out of the bounds of reality, right? That, that, that would happen to you. But if we look around, we can see those signs of grace, those little signposts to God in many places. One example for me was a few years ago, uh, a member of my former church in Queens spoke about having this just extremely annoying neighbor. He had been complaining about this neighbor for a couple years. He was, he was just so sensitive about sounds that any time uh, this guy would turn his stereo up just a little bit, you know, he'd get pounding on his wall from his neighbor, quiet down, quiet down. He once had a church gathering of 10 people at his house at 6 p.m. And they were eating dinner and talking in a normal voice when the police came. He had called the police on this guy for having a gathering where they were talking in normal tones. So this, was, this, this neighbor was just a constant thorn in my friend's side. But then he didn't hear from this guy for a long time. My neighbor, my friend, uh, didn't hear from him. And he wondered, you know, what's going on? And finally he knocked at his door and, and his neighbor had gotten sick. He was too weak even to complain. Um, and he had a lot of needs. He was not a very nice person. So he didn't have a lot of friends or family that cared for him. So this guy started going and getting his mail. And then he started getting him meals. And then he started hanging out with him. And the neighbor became no less annoying. He was still annoying and frustrating, but he kept doing it over and over again. And his friends started saying, well, what are you doing? Why are you going and hanging out with this guy? He's annoying. He's done nothing but bad things to you. And still, my, the former church member just said, I just do it because I need to do it. Grace. He fully undeserved gift to this neighbor and fully unobligated he did not need to do it in any way he wanted to do it and that is the gospel of our lord jesus christ our god is a god of grace he gives an undeserved gift he saves us and not only saves us but he gives us our status as children of god he calls us uh, children of his kingdom he says that we are ambassadors of his love. He gives us worth and identity and purpose in life and fully unobligated. God did not need to do that. He did not have to. He could have fully condemned us. He could have shunned us, but he did it. And that is grace. And so as we think about our identity, we're first reminded that we're saved by grace. We are children of grace. We are accepted by a God who gives us an undeserved gift, and he's fully unobligated. He does not need to do it. And that then leads to a second reality of who we are in grace, that we are free, that we are fully freed through God's grace. Paul writes in uh, Galatians 5.1, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Now the word freedom in this passage is defined as a state of liberty, as a being free from slavery. And that definition could describe a lot of different types of freedom. Could describe a, a freedom from oppression, could describe political freedom, personal freedom, emotional freedom, freedom of conscience, um, and all other types of freedom. But here Paul again is describing a spiritual freedom. That just like you are saved whether you feel it or not, or whether you're acting like it or not, you are free whether you feel it or not, whether you are acting or not. You are fully free from sin, death, and the devil. And this is so hard to understand because we don't feel free. Just like we don't feel saved, we don't feel free. 
We feel bound. We feel bound by sin. We feel bound by shame. But these are realities Paul again is speaking of right now. He uses the aorist form in Greek for the word free. And that is again a, a completed past action. So he is saying to, his, to the Galatians, you are free right now. And his uh, exhortation is to live as free people. But then he gives this warning. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. In Galatia at this time, there were false teachers that were coming into the Galatian church. The Galatian church was mostly comprised of pagans that were, had no idea about the Jewish law. They had never heard of it before. But they had just heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they had become followers of Christ. So at this time, though, there were Jewish Christians from Jerusalem that were coming in, and they were saying to these Galatian Christians, you need to follow Jesus, but you also need to be circumcised. If you're not following, you're, you're following Jesus, that's good, but you're not accepted by God until you're circumcised. And the idea of circumcision had to do with the whole idea of ceremonial law. Not the Ten Commandments, but this idea of you have to make certain sacrifices, you have to wear certain things, you have to do certain things, and that's how you're accepted. So it's really the idea of moral and religious performance. That you have to earn your salvation. You are not good enough until you're earning it. And Paul here responds later in Galatians 5 with a radical statement. He said, It is not the circumcision or uncircumcision that counts for anything. So circumcision would have been being very good by these false teachers. If you are circumcised, you're one of the good guys. You're one of the, you're in. But if you're uncircumcised, you're out. You're one of the bad guys. And Paul here is saying, that doesn't matter. And that doesn't matter. None of it matters. Only the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Now, just to grasp this reality a little bit, I want you to do a little experiment. I want you to make a list, and you can do it mentally, or you could write it on your phone, or if you have a pen, you can write it on your bulletin. And I want you to firstly make a nice list. And this is what you're going to do. I want you to think about just three or four things you've done that are good in the past few days. And don't be, don't be shy. You know? Like, if, if you think, I did a good job at that, like, say it. No one's going to read your list except you. So just think or write down two or three things. It could be, you know, I made dinner for my family. I completed my project at work and I did it well. Um, I had an encouraging conversation with a neighbor. I gave some money to the homeless. I, I was encouraging to someone on the street. Whatever. It could be just anything. We have all have a nice list. I'm sure of it. So just think about your nice list for a second. Just take a second to write them down. Just a few things. I'm sure you have a lot of nice things to do. Like, you're, like this congregation is filled with people who do lots of great things. So I'm sure there's a huge nice list for all of us. So now, though, think about your naughty list. Think about the things you have done that are not so good. Maybe that um, frustrating gesture to someone on the street um, or on the, in the car in front of you. Or the uh, unkind word to your family or the frustration towards your coworker, or so many other things. It could be kind of that top level of just little things you've said or done, or it could be that deeper level of deep sin or deep um, rebellion against God. Okay, so you have your nice list and your naughty list. And for Paul, Paul acknowledges this in circumcision and uncircumcision. Your nice list is, would be, to Paul, the circumcised, circumcision, all the things around that. And the naughty list would be uncircumcision. And Paul is saying in this passage that all of these count for nothing. Your good list, your bad list, none of it counts for anything. It is all, he even calls it rubbish in his own life. It is worthless. <laughs> And the only thing that matters is the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Spiritual slavery begins to happen when we live by our nice list or we're oppressed by our naughty list. 
When we, are, when we are focused on our nice list, we become self-righteous. I got to do good to earn salvation. And I'm sure none of you have said that, like got up in the morning and say, I need to earn my salvation today. I'm going to do it in these ways. You know, we just don't think that way. But we are earning our salvation every time we feel like, okay, I got to be good enough to earn someone's acceptance. I got to do this and this and this and this, and then I'll be good. Whether it's in your mind, I need to be successful enough, I need to earn enough, I need to have this kind of house and this kind of whatever, my family needs to look like this and act like this. Or it's just other ways, that other standards we have that if I do this, then I'm accepted. That's what Paul is saying. In the heavenly economy, that doesn't count for anything. God doesn't look at you and all your list of nice things and go, wow, you're so great, I'm letting you in. If anything, he looks at our nice list and goes, yeah, not enough. Wow, you got 10 things on your nice list, you should have 20. You got 20, you should have 40. You have 40, you should have 100. Nothing is going to match to God's standard of righteousness and goodness. And in the same way, our naughty list can just lead us to shame. Because especially if we're focused on our nice list and we're going, I need this and this and this and this to be righteous, when any of those things fall or break or we don't get the the standard, then we're we're devastated. And suddenly we feel shame. I'm not good enough. I'm terrible. I don't know if any of you have just woken up feeling just not good enough. And it's not guilt. It's not this feeling of I wake up and go, I did wrong, I got to fix it. That's guilt. And guilt is good. But often we wake up with a sense of shame. It's not like I've done something wrong. I am wrong. I am bad. And that shame can lead us to condemnation of going, well, I feel this way about myself, so of course God feels this way about about me. And of course other people feel this way about me. But that's the liberating word of grace. Is that that naughty list and the shame we feel does not condemn us any more than any other thing. And the nice list does not uh, save us any more than anything else. It's the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And when we begin to trust that grace where we get, we are given a new perspective on ourselves and others we're given a new perspective on our successes when you are succeed at something which i hope you are succeeding a lot at things you are doing but when we are trusting this message of grace we look at that success in a different way it's not what saves us it's not what gives us our worth But we can say, you know, this success is great, but it doesn't define me. I'm good enough and valuable enough regardless of whether I succeeded or failed. This success in no way changes Christ's love for me. I am not loved any more now than I was before I was successful, and I'm not loved any less. God is not somehow more proud of me now that I'm successful. God loved me unconditionally in Jesus Christ even before I was successful. And that can give us just a new sense of freedom to go and make, take risks in your job, to take risks in your life, to be creative, knowing that you may fail because failure is not fatal. It no longer condemns us. And in the same way, when we hit those failures, we can say the same thing to us. I trust that I am as loved now by God and as accepted by God as before I failed. And my performance actually is irrelevant to God's opinion of me. God is, in fact, always working for my good. And even failures and trials and struggles are somehow being transformed by God into goodness. There's a whole new way of looking at that. So often we kind of go up and down so much. And grace just helps us kind of have those ups and downs a little bit less extreme. We can experience the the frustration of our failures, but then we experience the assurance that that doesn't condemn us or save us. We can experience the joy of our successes, and it can be even more joyful because we know that it doesn't save us. We can be joyful in the moment because we know it's a gift, and even a gift of God. And that even helps us to understand others in a different way. You know, so often, just like we have a naughty and nice list, we put people into the naughty and nice list, and we all do it. We have people we think are good, they're worthy of our attention, they're they're in the nice list, they're the good people. And then we know that there are the bad people. They're the people who are not good, 
They're not worthy of our attention. They're only worthy of condemnation. And the message of grace just gets rid of that list. It just tears it up. Because suddenly we're all the same. We are all broken and sinful. And we are also all more loved than we know. So suddenly there's no distinction between me and another person. Sometimes we have to have those people in that naughty list because they're unsafe people. And they're people that, that it wouldn't be healthy or wouldn't be even safe physically to be around. But still, even the way we look at them changes in grace because we realize we're all sinners in need of God. We are all broken. We all vandalize shalom. So then, out of that, there's no distinction between me and you, between me and someone else. There's no cultural, racial distinctions anymore. There are no um, status distinctions and even wealth distinctions. We are the same. So I can approach someone in humility and go, I'm the same. Let's, you know, and out of that can come reconciliation. Out of that can come forgiveness. Out of that can come understanding of someone's struggles and someone's plight. Out of that, we can give someone the benefit of the doubt. We can uh, work towards reconciliation out of that. Tim Keller said that we're all worse than we realize and more um, loved than we can understand. And when we hold on to that, which is a vision of grace, then suddenly we can we can reconcile, we can care for each other because of grace. Martin Luther was once asked by uh, someone as he was preaching, the person asked him, well, you know, if, if all things are permissible in grace, then I can do what I please, right? And Luther said to him, well, indeed, you can do what you please, but what do you please? And this is the idea here that in grace, all things are permissible. You can wander away and still be covered by grace. You can sin and sin greatly and still be covered by grace. But it doesn't mean you understand grace. Because when we understand grace, then we want to live in grace. We want to respond to grace. We want to live out of grace. We want to give grace as we've received grace. So I encourage you today, my friends, to live in grace. To receive the, the salvation he's given to you in grace. To receive the freedom you have in grace and be enlivened then to see your lives differently and to love others differently because of it. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are good. That you give good grace. It's grace that can lead us to uh, desire social change. It's grace that leads us to love people who are very different than us. It's grace that leads us to want to care for those who are needing and even make societal changes that bring equity and justice and mercy. It's grace that causes us to put up with each other here in the church, even when we are fractured by divisions and um, uh, conflicts, it is grace that causes us to forgive and to reconcile. Lord, this is great, great grace. Help us to receive it personally so that we can know your great love in our lives in the midst of whatever we're going through. And help us, Lord, to give it as good grace, an undeserved gift given by an unobligated giver. We thank you, God. In your son's name we pray. Amen and amen.